Salam and hello. My name is Lily Bakala Piper and welcome to Uproot. I am so happy that you're with me today. I've missed talking to you, I've missed connecting, and today we have a fantastic conversation for you to listen to. I don't know about you, but I have been reading a lot in these last few months as we continue to stay at home and stay safe from COVID-19. There are wonderful books out there, and I have to say one of my absolute favorites is The Havoc of Choice by Wanjiru Konyangi. And I am delighted that Wanjiru, also known as Shiro, will be joining us here today on the show to talk about her debut novel and the incredible choices she also made in order to bring it to life. During this episode, we explore the havoc of choice with the members of my book club here in Nairobi. A little bit of a different approach to the podcast, but I was so pleased to have the voices and perspectives of these amazing women with me as I interviewed Shiro. The Havoc of Choice is set in Kenya during the post-election violence of 2007 and 8. The book Havoc of Choice centers on an elite Nairobi family. Kavata and Ngugi are a couple whose marriage hits its hardest and most difficult moment when Ngugi decides to enter the 2007 election. That decision is complicated by Muli, Kavata's father who is a corrupt Nairobi politician. Their two kids, Wanja and Amani, make their own set of choices that bring heartache to the family. And besides this nuclear unit, there are so many other characters that bring the decisions and the havoc of that 2007 election season to life. I can't wait to talk to Wanjiro about her characters, her choices, and also about the work that she does in Nairobi as one of the co-founders of BookBunk. BookBunk has been working over the last three years to renovate some of Nairobi's most historic libraries. So Wanjira is not only an author, but she's a devout activist, she's a Nairobian, and she has so much to share with us. So listen in as we talk to Wanjiru Shiro Konyange about her debut novel, The Havoc of Choice. So welcome, Shiro. It is such a joy to have you here today with Uproot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. So even though we just met, I feel like we may go back in another life. We were yeah, friends. I'm sure we do. We've been, be been friends for a long time. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to the book club who's also here. This is a really special day for me because all these amazing women, um, we've shared stories and laughter and time together over the years. So thank you, all of you, for being here today to just warm this circle and to round it out talk about the havoc of choice mm -hmm. which just the title alone draws you in you know without knowing anything else but let me start by asking you how did the story come to be mm. I love that question um, so in 2012 I moved to Cape Town to do my master's in, in creative writing and I had this big idea to write a book about my father he just passed away and I was heartbroken and I wanted to write this big memoir about this man like, like I call him the love of my life still um, and I get to Cape Town and I'm ready I've signed up on my ECT I have a cute apartment um, and I, I started attending classes and everyone asked me oh you're Kenyan how are you guys doing and I'm just like we're fine I'm just what are you talking about and it, the question kept coming how are you guys doing about 07 like you guys went through what for South Africans was the worst possible idea of hell based on the reputation we had in the region as being this island of peace and this really democratic place where everything's working out. So for the guys who lived outside the country in South Africa specifically, they were just like, you guys cannot be fine. It's only been, then it had been five years since, yeah. four years actually. So it kept coming back to me and the idea of how can anybody experience that and accept and move on as easily as we did. Yeah. And I began, so when I when something stays with me, I read as much as I can. And I went into the library, I went onto YouTube, I went onto the internet and watched every single clip mm -hmm. from that time. I read all of the reports and I spent maybe six months, six to eight months wow. reading about the violence yeah. and I was sure there was no yeah. way we were okay. Yeah. I still get emotional thinking about of it because we can't be fine. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that, that we must sit in the pain and, and and like just wallow with it but I'm just like there's a thing about like he healing together and grieving together that I don't think we did in Nairobi yeah. um, and I before this book and actually before it's released I never considered myself a political person or I called myself apolitical very proudly yeah. but then when I was writing draft one of this book as somebody who didn't really grow up engaging in politics 
I, I remembered what the ministries looked like in 1993 in Kenya, and I remembered who was running that ministry and all of, mm-hmm. and who was doing that, and then Attorney General who did this. And I'm just like, so much about politics sticks, it sips in and it stays there, yeah. and we care about it. Kenyans politic in a way that many other countries do, but there's a passion and a drive that influences our everyday um, politicking. Um, and all of those reasons, I think, what made me write this book, because I, I realized that we are not okay, yeah. and I wasn't going to... Um, write a self-help book about how to grieve political <laughs> violence. I'm like, the thing that means the most to all the Kenyans in my life is family. Yeah. And therefore, family became the, the, the best way to tell this story. Yeah. So people are asking you, you know, are you guys okay? So you start to research, and, and there's a way to understand what happened in 2007 intellectually. Um, and then there's another way, having experienced it, that you felt that. So mm-hmm. were you here in 2007, and how did you experience it as a Kenyan during that time? Yep, I was here. Um, it was the first election I was living in, at the time, Moshava or Runda. Either in my parents' house just by Runda or in Moshava. I can't say six. It was very, very far removed. So in this book, I was, I was definitely the Waja who was just trying to buy some liquor yeah, yeah. and get on with her day. But that was my experience of the violence. Yeah. <laughs> True story. Yeah. Um, I remember my sister, Shiko, who's not here today, we, were dry, we went to Village Market and the liquor stores were empty. And we're like, huh? Mm. I'm like, you guys, like, it's Christmas. Because it was, it was just the holidays. Yeah. Right? It was holiday season. So we're just like, what's happening? So I was definitely in Nairobi. I had first had my, I voted for the first time in that election. Mm. It was my first election. And I'd worked on that election as well from a civil, um, a, a, how am I trying to call it, a civic um, perspective. Sure. So I was trying to get the young people to vote. And we had this massive campaign that I ran. At the time, I was working for Eric Wainaina and Shiva Hass at Rainmaker Limited. And we had this massive campaign all over the country to get young people to vote. And we use music and we use art. And we just, also for the first time, the idea of art becoming a voice that so, so changed change, became yeah. real for me. Yeah. So I was proud of that election because we had the highest voter turnout of, of any election in the country at that point. And I remember like, we've done it well done, high fives and everything. And the violence happened, I think, for, to be honest, in the first few weeks, I must have just been wearing like some kind of like, there was some, some, some kind of like force field blocking me from it. So I was definitely removed from it. No one that I, that I was in my family had experienced any kind of loss. The people who experienced the loss are people who, um, like in the book, were our, our drivers and the cleaners and the mm-hmm. people who kind of keep your life going and they couldn't yeah. come to work and that way becomes a thing for, uh, yeah. this thing is so inconvenient. Yeah. Um, so, so as I was trying to explore how, how we could be okay, we also bought this like how, how, how highways <laughs> separate the way things are experienced in the city and all those things became so peculiar to me when I was outside reading about my country and being like this is not on like what's happening I'm um, going to come back to that because there was a point in the book too where um, I think it's Wanja says uh, who's one of the characters says this is not my Nairobi and so I want to come back to that because how people experienced 2007 very much had to do with where they lived, what their last name was, yeah. how much money they made yeah. per month, you know, yeah. what kind of security they had to survive. And if they could leave. You know, if they could leave at yeah. all, yeah. So so there's this academic understanding. You've had a personal experience. I mean, being a, a, a political activist, even though you were saying you're apolitical, getting kids to, to or not kids, young people to register to vote is a political act. Completely. So it's a saying, you know, this is participatory. You need yeah. to be, show up. So when you put all that together, tell me how, Kava, comes to be born? Mm-hmm. How does Ngugi kind of first come to you? Mm-hmm. When do these characters start to take on form such that you can give them a story? Mm-hmm. You want to hear me question? <laughs> um, so some of the characters I've known a really long time. So Ngugi was probably the first character I ever wrote. Um, okay. Thu as well, Chepto as well. So them, they've been showing up in a lot of my short stories that I, w- were unpublished. Um, and when I and when I started the the book, I didn't really have strong characters. In fact, I think the characters were what I kept getting notes about from my editors. Okay. The plot was was there because we all know what happened. There was no kind of question about who did it. Was mm-hmm. just Google it. It's all it's all there. So I knew what the story was, um, and I knew that I, I could I could take up. And in fact, at some point, I wanted to write a nonfiction piece where you had like these seven people who you don't really know are connected. Um, and you only find out in the last three chapters that actually all oh, they're from the same family. It was one of the short stories about each of them, but I yeah. couldn't really, I don't think I was a good enough writer then. Mm. Um, but also it just made sense to connect them and, and have people fall in love with them individually in this container. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's a home, that's a house. Um, so I think the plot is what really, um, I had the plot first and I had to ask myself what kind of representation do I want to give. Mm. So even um, having 
um, Kikuyu Maria Kamba was very deliberate, right? Mm -hmm. Having them have a Lua running their house or just having all of the different tribes in some yeah. way, not all of them, but as many as are You're popular. trying to create havoc right uh, there. Exactly. Just like, let me just put in all, all those ingredients and, and, and have just... people be like, how does not like that in Kenya? Why not? Why aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. But also what was more important that I wanted to, to show a landscape of what's happening around the country and the only way I could do that is if there's somebody who's going there. So yeah. I can't show you what's happening in Kisumu if I don't have someone who's from there. Yeah. So it really yeah. became, in fact, the, the strongest point was just, I want to show a, a kind of nationwide country, um, a picture, and because Kenyans typically go home to vote, that was that's, that, that made the most sense because then you can show what's happening everywhere at the coast. At the, you can't just draw a story from yeah. the a character's lens. Right. It was always going to be stronger. Absolutely. So the plot definitely um, influenced what characters um, mm. I wrote. Some of them were hardest. Amani and Kavata kept mm. coming back to me. Like mm. my, my my editors didn't believe Kavata. They're like, you need to make the reader believe her or like mm. at least under empathize with her. Yeah. Um, Amani kept coming back to me because I knew <laughs> I knew what was going to happen to him. Like, and I was just like, <laughs> I, mm. wanna, I don't want to fall in love with this boy because I knew yeah. that someone's going to have to die. And you named him Peace. You really, you really played with us, <laughs> our emotions with that name. Yeah, <laughs> really. yeah. So let me, let me come. Oh, yeah. Lisa, has, this one, she's the mic and, and jump right in. Yeah. So we, we definitely wanted, for those of you who are listening, to really experience what Book Club is like, which is a lot of, uh, you know, comments, I laughter, inter a lot. Inter I didn't want to say interruptions, but yes, <laughs> those two, they're most welcome. <laughs> I didn't like Kavata. No? Yeah. Tell us why. why. Um, I, I, I didn't empathize with her. I found her to be, I, um, her friend, Anne, her friend Anne asked her, you know, if you leave, what is it? What is it that you know? What is it that you want to get from this? What is the outcome that yeah. you want? Mm. She never had the answer, mm. and I felt like um, she ultimately just abandoned her family in my mind. Yeah, Kavita was complicated. So, if you haven't read the book, you know we have this—I don't even know if you would call her a protagonist in some ways—but you know you have this character Kavita who's at the center. It's her decision, in a way, her mm. choice, choice that kind of dominoes through everybody else's life in some ways. Um, Tell us about Kavita, because even her name, I remember Donna and I were talking when we first we were like, is, is she black Kenyan? Or is she South Asian? Her name was throwing us off just because it was Kavita, because we all know Kavita oh, somewhere, you know? So even that, company. yeah, so we were like, oh, it is, okay, because even company. the name, it was just close enough to like a South Asian name that I thought, oh, okay, what is yeah. she trying to really hint at? To be honest, the, the name, I met a Kenyan in Stellenbosch called Kavata, and I'm like, I love that name. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Stellenbosch, and Mackie. And Mackie. <laughs> she was also like stunningly beautiful. Beautiful. In fact, I want to know you. I just didn't even know this, but I'm, I'm like, I really ah, fell in love with that so name. So, Kavita, if you're out there, you yeah, tell me, Josh, where are you? Kavita from, <laughs> from Stellenbosch. Um, Kavita is, is probably, you know what, she's the one that people react to the most and the one I have the most empathy for. Mm. Because Kavita, in my, in, well, I also need to step away from, from her sometimes. <laughs> she, she, nothing she did was was not happening. She, she said, she said, if you do this, I will leave you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I also, when people, when people blame her for the, for the drama, it really sits with me for like, where, where does blame begin, right? Mm -hmm. If you blame Kabata, what about her mother or her father, who's actually like, potentially, no, actually, he is a problem at the beginning of all of the now, problems, he, right? him, I did never liked. I never so liked like, Muli at so all. every yeah. time someone talks about Kabata, I'm like, start from the place where, why, why is a woman yeah. who did the thing mm. that she said she would do the place where blame rests, okay. right? Not the guy who did the thing that yeah. <laughs> he was asked not to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, that's for me is is is, is mm -hmm. a place that I still don't have full, full answers for, but I really I really hope that with Kavata there's a, there's a lot more grace mm -hmm. given to the to women and, and, and the way that that they make decisions because often most people would be like you should have stayed for the family yeah. you should have stuck yeah. it, stuck through it but why her kids as she said were gonna be fine he was an incredible father so me me dragging them out of the country because of the beast I'm having with their father is actually not fair mm -hmm. so yeah. I'm leaving because I have a a problem with my yeah, husband, yeah, the kids yeah. want to be involved. I appreciate what you're saying. Um, that who we want to own, yeah. you know, either the outcome or the decision. And I think that that's a fascinating way to frame it. Um, Janet, I see you wanting to jump in. Please jump in. <laughs> it's easy to blame Kavata because our money died. I think there's a yeah, reason. There's right. you know the, the baby died, mm -hmm. and it was like where where was mom? Maybe she, mm -hmm. maybe the baby wouldn't have died had the mom been around. And I mm -hmm. think. There is a way that women are unfairly blamed, right, for, for events that take place, particularly when there's a child mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think it's turned out differently. Um, I think it would be easier to have empathy for Kavata. 
<laughs> oh, no, I don't, bl- I don't, I, I actually, it never crossed my mind to blame her for a child dying. I just, um, I think I hold women to a high standard. Mm. If you're going to make a decision with such gravity, have thought through what is it you want to achieve. I felt like um, it, was, it was more emotive versus pragmatic. And but I think that's exactly what uh, Shiro's point is, is that we do hold women to a higher standard. She said, if you run, I will leave. Mm. And then when she did that thing, Instead of kind of reevaluating why and Googie just didn't say, okay, I won't run then. For the sake of our family, for the sake of our marriage, I will pull out. He did not. He also made a choice, made a choice. which was to remain in the, in, in that election. Yeah. 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 Donica, you wanted to do Yeah. Thing? I was going to say, I really like your decision to start with her because I didn't come to the book with much information. I didn't know much about it when I first started. I think if I had the background that it's about the elections, I would have come with my own, like, this is the way it's supposed to be. And I wouldn't take have taken that character with the honesty that I think you portrayed her with. And um, the decisions that she made, I'm thinking, Lisa, I, I think back to how she grew up. It's like a lifetime of burden with her father and all the misgivings that she felt he was doing. And she couldn't she couldn't quite align to it. So it was all of that avalanching into her decision making then. I don't agree with it either. I mean, it's hard to leave your kids, but I can understand like the events that led up to her. Um, and I can imagine in a real life situation where that, that would happens. happen. Yeah. I think the the character that I felt that was the weakest was Ngugi for sure. Mm. Because weak, he did how? He weak in character? Just weak like as a person he was as weak because he broke his promise to her. Like he succumbed. Mm. Um, but then the inevitability of it also struck me that the the dad Muli was controlling everything yes. and he was going to control everything anyway. Mm. And the, the calamity that uh, that I, I, I heard about the elections. We were not in Kenya, but very, very close. Like Zambia, I guess, is close enough because it's, it still felt like we were listening to the news and all of that. And then to hear it unraveling from just such an individual point of view, I, I felt very shaken as I was reading each of the events because I knew it actually happened. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's so build on this idea because you, you start with Kavita. The story starts with her, this mother, two children, married to, Somebody who was political in college, but necessarily didn't have the ambitions. Mm. Something fa- Ngugi's first venture into, you know, public service is corrupted by her father, mm. which kind of shatters him. But then you do inter- introduce these other women. So let's talk about more of the women characters, because you introduce several of them right around that s- as time that we meet in Kavata. We meet Wanja, her 20 year old, something like yeah. daughter or so yeah. in university. We meet Chepo. Chepto. You think all the Kenyans are like, Chepto! <laughs> Get that T. We pronounce every consonant in this language. <laughs> yeah. I just dropped the T. Okay, okay. So Chepto. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. So let's talk, let's talk about Chepto. Chepto clearly struck a nerve with this, yeah. this group. So let's talk about Chepto. Where did... Tell me about Chepto. Yeah, Chepto <laughs> and, and, and her husband what came came to me together. Mm. Um, I really loved um, Thu's gentle, easy nature, yeah. and 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 I and I just loved the balance between them. So for me, they were always like two pieces enough. But I never thought about them like a separate people. But I also I wanted the for me Chepto is a fire in the book. She's the one who's gonna change things. Mm-hmm. Her and Wanja to be to, to be to be to some extent. Because Wanja also is very quiet, but she's just like I'm gonna sit here and be underestimated. Yeah. And I'm gonna do I'm gonna change things yeah. in my own way. But I really wanted the 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 hero in the book to be somebody who is the most overlooked in our society. I am grateful for the people who make my life easier, for who make sure I don't have to leave my house and I can stay home and in my pajamas all day. Mm. And I don't think that we've taken enough time to actually think about those people and, and how those people, how they bend their lives to make ours a lot more comfortable. Absolutely. And, and when Chepto is, when, when she, she's the kind of woman who has a fire in her, she will speak her mind, she will sh- yard whoever she is, and she will take pride in whatever life has dealt her, be it a kanga or a Gucci bag. She's like, I'm here. Mm-hmm, I'm here mm-hmm, for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's definitely the character who I want to be more of. I think like yeah. her, her throat chakra is completely like, clear. <laughs> there's, there's nothing. There's nothing kind of clogging it. And and she she for me is just like the fire. And she's she the energy. Is, yeah. And she's she's a reason. I think I see more. I see hope in her. And one time when I didn't any of the characters. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I yeah. loved her relationship with Thu, her husband. I mean, it was adoring. He adored her. Yeah. And it was clear she had a deep. Uh, Adoration for him too, for who they were. Do you see? Did you see Chepto and Scola in the same lens? Because they they uh, they take up this similar space yeah. in the terms of the work that they do in our society. Yeah. 
And Skolo herself yeah. also had strength and commitment that is just really breaks you at the end when mm-hmm. she's violated. Um, mm-hmm. Tell me about Skolo also. What did you want us to understand from her? I, I want to say, again, it goes back to the point about the people who hold our lives up. And I think those two women, again, are the, are the reasons why um, mm-hmm. Flo, is able to, if Flo is able to do his work because he's going home to this family that's being held up by this mm-hmm. incredible woman. Mm-hmm. And for Skolo as well, who served that family for so long and almost kind of earned her, her entire life and her, yeah. her, her wealth that she then yeah. invested elsewhere from yeah. working from this family. Yeah. And it's, it's a very, I mean, I think she loved that family dearly, as one yeah. does when you spend years and years raising them and all of that. Um, and I, I really, like, there's just a silent power to the both of them that I, that I wanted to, to, to bring out. I think and, and in, my, in, my, in my life, women run everything. Yeah, don't they? Um, do. And even if they're of the loudest ones, and, and the idea of like who must be the dominant one in a relationship, in, in, in Flo and Chepto, it's definitely Chepto, but is there any less respect or love or functionality yeah, in that relationship? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, the, the way in which scholar is just like, listen, eh? mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you said, this is very bad what yeah. you've done, but you can't yeah. have your kids see you like yeah, this. Yeah. That is something that I see the nannies in my life saying yeah. to, to any one of us um, at any point of our lives. Yeah. My husband, my husband made the joke the other day that we should va- they should vac- the world should vaccinate all the women first right? because if the women are not like going to survive this thing then the world will not survive and I had to be like you're right because it's everything it's everything. the covering it's the grace it's yeah. the, the the heart of me I mean so, so I also thought I think you could write a sequel Skola's Choice also <laughs> because when she chooses after being raped to like with a limp, come back and get dressed and serve the family. That that's when my first tear fell was actually her because I was like, that's a choice. Yeah. I mean, that is a choice that she had to make because of the havoc around her. You know, like it was really. And then at the end, when you do an epilogue, I, I really appreciate the epilogue. There's so much I want to say. Gosh, I need to look at my notes, but I appreciate the epilogue because sometimes when we read these books based in history and, and we don't always get the resolutions yeah. because it's like what happened. But I appreciate you did kind of give us snapshots of what could be possible for these characters. And the mm-hmm. fact that she eventually realizes she wasn't the only one alone. She wasn't the only one sexually assaulted. Mm-hmm. And that brought her some comfort. But mm-hmm. yet the choice she made, yeah. I mean... Yeah. Wow. And I don't know how many of you, like, I have a grandmother who worked till she, she was 100 and... How old was she when she passed? 102. Wow. And she kept saying, I'm going to keep working because if I stop, I will die. And I, have, I know so many women in my life who are just like that. I'm like, when trauma happens, I'm going to say, let's just keep going. And even if it's not the healthy thing to do. Yes, yeah, I was going to say, why? Why do we do that to ourselves? Yeah. Ah. And, and, and that's something about Scholar. I think when she was faced with a choice, she was like, I could, I could sit with this trauma or I could do the thing that, that has given me purpose for all of my life. And I think yeah. that's what she chose to do. The number thing, I'm a complete geek. I love me some numbers. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> when I was reading the final, or well, reading the final edit, um, I remember I hadn't really, I had put a, num- an, an, a, a number to how many people had died and how many families had been displaced, but not the women who got raped. Yeah, I don't think I've read that number either. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And I read it l- literally the year or two before the book came out because I was just like, what? Yeah. And I thought about Scholar immediately and, and, then, and that line was something I added much, much later. And even the epilogue, we, kind of, we always discuss if, it has a, if the epilogues have a place mm. in like fiction because this yeah. is a work of fiction sure. so you don't, sure. you can even yeah. your resolution yeah. but I'm like, there's no real resolution because yeah. we, we know from the country we live in that everything is the same. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely, mm. there's definitely a, a, a reason or desire for me to, to root that experience for the reader in actual numbers and actual factual yeah, numbers. And it's, and it's worth reading. It's 40,000. Let's see, I have it just here. 40,500 40, people just like her. Yeah. Women and children were raped between December 27, 2007 and June 2008. An extraordinary cause. Yeah, I appreciated the epilogue, but it also upset me mm. because I couldn't figure out why um, Skola died four years later. I was thinking to myself, was she just, and maybe she was much older because there was nothing in the book that let me know how old she was. Mm. The idea that it was um, that experience that um, caused, you know, caught, you know, it cut short her life. That, that idea mm. um, really upset me. Mm. Mm. It upset me. She must have just been much older. <laughs> she was a virgin because she bled when he she bled, raped but her. I thought no, because it was violence. It was violence. Was violence. Was violence. I don't think that was because of the... It's because she, it's cause she was a virgin. Yeah. I got that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So she was not that old. Mm. That breaks she was, me too. As soon as I saw yeah. that, I, yeah. I was like, oh, she must be young. That's the image oh, that I had in my mind. That, oh. I mean, I saw I read it. I just need a minute then. That just really... Um, <laughs> <I'm> like, wow. <laughs> because I remember there's that moment after that the policeman wipes himself off. And that made me think... Could she be a virgin? But yeah. then I was like, no. It just was really 
aggressive. That's why he didn't resist when uh, she took her money, money back. Because yeah. he didn't realize that she was a virgin. Oh, oh, wow. Hello, fellow okay. writer. Alicia, Alicia, good. <laughs> fellow writer, true. <laughs> Alicia, good. Okay, I think that he just was shamed utterly by the act. Mm. I thought that's why. I mean, it may well be because of that, but it, as well. But um, it, if I may ask a question, I have many questions, but one of the <laughs> questions I wanted to ask you, and I'm not indiscriminately or in uh, indirectly, I guess, trying to determine your age, but when one when one to doesn't get that opportunity to vote because of what what happens as she's working at the ODM headquarters. And um, do you do you think did that kind of was that a reflection of how you felt a little bit as a maybe as a younger person, uh, slightly maybe less compelled or less caught up in the tribal distinctions? Because I know it's often the younger generation that isn't quite as engaged with those distinctions. Yeah. They're willing to overlook those. So did that reflect a little bit of your maybe frustration at, uh, at having the election sort of stolen from you, so to speak, or stolen from, mm. or is that... Her choice was stolen. Her choice in yeah. a way was stolen yeah. from her. Yeah. I mean, of course, you know, yeah. So I just wondered if that reflected that a little bit, or is that was that you were thinking of something different? That's a really good question, and one um, I've never thought about, but I will now. Um, <laughs> I'm <laughs> I, Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I know that the, the anger I felt at the end of that election was not because of who won and who didn't, because I don't even know if I cared, to be honest. Right. Um, I can't remember who I actually voted for, if I can be completely honest, but it wasn't about the result, it was about the after. I was really upset that this thing that's supposed to be the height of mm -hmm. our citizenry mm -hmm. was being, pardon my French, yeah. shut on yeah. by, by, by more money and more politics and more um, selfish, selfish will. Um, so I don't know, and also a part, a, a, that's the scene, the, the parts in those scenes that ran through for me were just like the bullying that happens around like these moments. We've all gone to like a police station or any kind of government mm -hmm. office where you're just, you're just not treated with like honor and respect yeah. and I hate that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of what was like irritating me at that point. But then I think about it, that, that idea of just like elections being taken for granted when a country that, that does so well at like exercising its, its right to vote and, and really we politics having, and, and the level of politicking here is, is quite interesting and engaging and it sits in your mind obviously yeah, because yeah. I, I didn't know what I knew until I had to write it down yeah, um, yeah. but it was just so that idea say that again you didn't know what you knew until you wrote it down yeah. what, what do you mean what do you mean like how politics ran in the <laughs> I 90s see. so um, seeing it written out and you're like A like, to B to C you're like A I'm like you know, something yeah, 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 yeah. reading yeah. all the pages how it That's was reminded me because yeah. the first draft is very just like blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, but I could remember the ministries in 96 I could remember the clashes of 96 when I could remember these things that I didn't think I spent my life watching actively watching the news for mm -hmm. but when you grow up in a space where you have to watch the news twice an evening yeah my family was the same too every day every day after yeah. dinner yeah yeah Lisa do you want to follow up yeah well I did <laughs> I see you had the mic again but, so but that's why I love Chipto's response when she first went to the police station um you know I don't know if you guys remember that but she's like your uniform means that you work for me um mm -hmm. and she has this sort of indomitable sense of herself vis-a-vis -vis the rest of society, which I think you were kind of, you know, we've all felt that. I've, we've all probably been harassed at some point by a um, uh, servant of the state in Kenya. But I, I have a slightly harder question for you, if you don't mind me asking. All um, right. Well, you want to take some water before she... I'm going to take some water, too. Just in case. Ooh. Just in case. <laughs> okay, we're to give her the mic. Give her the mic twice. I know. I have to just take the mic from her. <laughs> I, you know, I have to say, I was here when this happened, and I, I remember, you know, as an outsider watching both hopefully and, you know, also somewhat, um, you know, a bit morbidly, I think, hoping that the things wouldn't follow through the way sure. that we all kind of heard sort of implications that they might. But anyway, I, so I, I really enjoyed, not enjoyed, that's not the right word, I really appreciated the opportunity to go through that again in such a... Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, in such a focused way. Mm. But I wanted to ask you a question. There's a, there's a phrase when, when the, um, you know, just after they break the news that they're not going to be able to relay the results of the election and, um, and then there's the announcement of the winner and there's these anger, state house rigging, et cetera. You, you mentioned something about, um, long forgotten tribal stereotypes were now used as ammunition. A line was crossed. And you talk about men blinded by murderous rage. Uh, when I read that, I was a little bit struck by the idea that you chose not to maybe 
kind of focus on the ways in which, other than the indirect corruption of Muli and his cronies, this had been building. It wasn't just a sudden, mm, it wasn't, it didn't yeah. just happen all at once. There yeah. was a clear pattern yeah. of development. And so I just wondered from your understanding of the events, why you maybe kind of chose not to emphasize that and to kind of see it as this sudden violent outpouring. And let me let me add a question to that too. I, I, I think a few novels I've read read about Kenya um, will we'll give that you know colonial kind of history and picture what happened at independence, what happened just post independence. Of course, Moy. I mean, and then they kind of present you with today in order to almost say to the reader. You know, this has not been easy for Kenya. Like, yeah. you know, let's not brush over history. But you did make a deliberate choice. I think focused is, is a good word to say. You did hone in with a laser precision mm. on the selection, the immediate players, without necessarily inviting the reader to take in Kenya as a whole. Yeah. Um, so, t yeah, tell us about that choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll take a break. <laughs> <How about that? laughs> so, um, I want to start at the at the reason why the book started on the 27th or 23rd of December. So I really questioned where to start the story. Yeah. So I knew where it was ending. But you're right, you're talking about elections when you have to talk about like the, the birthing of the nation and the people who were there before and, the, and colonialism and all of these things that are really big for kind of like formation pillars of who, who we are as a country. And I struggled with that because I had done a lot of kind of linking in my research. Um, it's like the hate radio. Exactly, yeah. exactly, radio exactly, stations. exactly. Yeah. Um, so I had to first of all decide to, to, to start as close to the story, to the, to, the, to the kind of election day as possible, because I think one of the the, the thing about grad, so going to school for these things that you, you have these mantras in your mind about like write what you know and begin the story as close to possible as at the end. And that's what I thought about the most with this book: start okay. close as possible to the end, to the end. so you can yeah. paint a, a brightest picture as possible, right? Mm. Because if I go back to 1963, this book would be 700 pages yeah, yeah. long, <laughs> rightfully so, rightfully so. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I have also because there's bits that I it took out a lot. The, the hit radio actually got got out. Um, I, I removed later and later drafts because I kept getting more questions to expound on that and expound and expound and expound. I'm like it's going to become another book about book about itself, the, yeah. the reason for the violence. Mm -hmm. Well, I really wanted to again bring this back to like the family and also localize it as much as possible because everybody's coming back to Nairobi. I'm like, how can we centralize what's happening in the kind yeah. of like election center? I do wish maybe some because I've gotten that question before around the the colonialism and how it sh it shaped the novel. But I think that everything about our lives today is shaped by colonialism, and I think mm -hmm. that that that. That linkage is important, um, and maybe it will be book number three or four, I don't know, <laughs> because it really tells everything that yeah. we do, how we choose to get yeah. married, how we, what, what, yeah. I'm fighting the safari com now because I've decided <laughs> that my first name will be the name on my Mpesa after 15 yeah. years of me using Mpesa with the name that I have chosen for myself. Right. They're like, no, 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 from no. now we're going to call you Wendy. And I'm like, excuse me, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot do that. So for yeah. me, everything about the book <laughs> is a re result of this, of this period of our lives. And I think that, and, and I'm also, it's something that I'm learning a lot more in the work that we do with libraries, just how deep it sits with us and how every single thing that we do, how we dress, how, how we do, how, how we build our homes, mm. how we choose to, to meet our partners and what governs the way that we love people. That's all been so skewed and I think that mm -hmm. a lot more detail is needed to, to, to connect those things more than I could have gone to, gone into yeah. at the book, but I could have done a bit better to kind of connect the, the, the reasons for the violence and the and the different people who played. I had to remove all of the, um, I had very funky names for the political part, uh, the people who are running for the election. Because as you notice, I'll, I'll say, the ODM, ODM was like an opulence people's party, and yeah. I prepared one of the, the acronyms, and I had put in political yeah. um, parties in the text and had placed blame in some places, and then it really got too close to nonfiction when I did that, and yeah. I wanted I wanted it to be got in the way of the truth, right? Because mm -hmm. then if you mentioned it, you begin to get people kind of picking up the book, yeah. and today I haven't gotten much like hate <laughs> yet um, <laughs> from anyone who feels like they've been unnecessarily like um, um, mm -hmm. putting a negative light because sure. book, they don't think that was a point, right? Yeah. Um, and it just became a point where it will, it, it'll do more if you just make it balanced. And I had to also address my bias because just before I went to press, I sent this book to a person who was different, as different as could be from I am in background, in tribe, in like ethics, in like everything, right? And I'm like, Oti, read this book shred it to pieces, let me know everything and read it with all of your biases, all of them, bring them, your mm. religious one, your tribal one, bring it all. <laughs> and he did. And that, those sets of notes that he gave me are the reason this book is as balanced as it is today because mm. I would be like, he told me that one, one, one piece of feedback was that when you say who's responsible, you blame the low side first. 
you can do anything you want to do to your book. But understand what that means coming from a woman your age with your last name living in Nairobi. Yeah. Understand what the yeah. culture yeah. will be you saying. Understand what that, that choice means. Yeah. What that choice what means. What that choice means. And I'm like, I do it. I'm just like, yeah, 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 I don't care. But then I'm just like, but hang on, you want to spend your life writing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you want to spend your life making people see things differently. So why you want to burn that bridge? And it's not necessary. This is yeah. not the book to. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? My name is Anyondo, and it's not true. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome <laughs> to. <laughs> okay. It's also not true. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, 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 I, I get where my bias is, and I was like, that, that bias is based on 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 mm. everything that 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 I kind of come to the table with. Yeah. Um, so a lot of those things began to take the book into a dangerous spot, which is why it just made sense to remove them, yeah. Yeah. um, and to, to to round it again in family, in in the in the the, the thing that we all care about besides. I mean, yeah. outside of who, where we live and or what tribe we are, we all care about our families. Yeah. And that's why I have Absolutely. to keep coming back. So. And you have multiple families. There's like exactly. this family and this family, so we're looking at it through many ways. And I actually appreciate that you maybe didn't give that history because there's been a lot recently, I think, in the wake of political movements around the world around justice and equity since George Floyd was killed. A lot of the, the conversations have been around who, why do we always have to educate other people about our trauma too? Mm. So when you start a story without giving the history of X, Y, Z, you're also saying this book is for who it's for. And if you want to learn more, if you understand, then do that research. But I'm not going to do it for you. I'm not going to set every path for you to there. Come with that knowledge if you you like. But this is my story. This is my choice. Um, We're going to hear from Washuka, and then we're going to actually take a bit of a break. This has been amazing, but there's so much more. We need to talk about the men (laughs) in this book. We spend so much time about the women. We're going to shift to the men. But yes, Um, first, Washuka, please. I promise. Yes, absolutely. Um, No, I just wanted to point out, I think, in, in, in regard to that question, which I think is really, really important, And it's a conversation that Shura and I have had um, connected to, there was a similar question asked of Billy Kahora, who was the editor of Kwani for a very long time, nearly a decade. And Marjorie Luda Magoy, um, who was one of the best writers um, that we have produced in Kenya, um, or rather writing about Kenya at the time, the question that Billy had asked was, were the fundamental texts that should show us what this moment is, we feel alone, we feel lost, we feel like we have no context, no background. And Marjorie Oluda Magoy said, actually, no. Um, There's a myriad of texts that have been produced by Kenyan scholars, academics, fiction writers, people doing nonfiction, all these other forms that speak to where this moment has come from, Mm -hmm. from that culture of same Lolongo in elections, Mm -hmm. to um, the first kind of documented tribal clashes that we have around around that moment, which I think for me as a young person was probably Molo in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that way, from an editorial perspective, I did appreciate where it started from, because when I started to read this text in its very early stages, I started to think of a niece of mine who's now 20, mm-hmm. who didn't really necessarily have that the same context yeah. that I did yeah. as a woman in their 30s. But I also started to remember that people like Yvonne the Yambo War wrote about this from that kind of perspective that you're asking for. Yeah. They kind of go back to the assassination of Tom Boyer, what that moment mm-hmm. means, mm-hmm. and why we are where we are today, Mm -hmm. um, that other formidable writers, that other forms, other mediums, that people like Boniface Mwangi took that work, did Mm -hmm. their photography, did an exhibition. So in that way, I did appreciate that as a sort of point of departure, if you like, and not necessarily something that had to sit um, quite firmly in this perspective. Yeah, I think that's really, really powerful because I think it's, it, this is always going to be the burden, I think, on women writers, people of color, African writers, is like taking on the mantle to educate the entirety of the world just because they maybe have not had the same level of exposure. And yet, it would have taken away from what you wanted to accomplish, which yeah. was, this is a family of multiple players who had incredible choices to make mm-hmm. that affected their entire lives. It's been incredible just to hear everyone's perspectives on the choices in particular that the women had to make and how this book came to be. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the men in the book. We're going to talk about the resolution of this incredible novel and what we've all learned from it, how it's changed us, how it's impacted us. So come back. We'll have more with Shiro and the Havoc of Choice. 